for my love, they have ab my adversary. They are my adversary. But I am all, but I am all prayer. And they have laid upon me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set you a wicked man for him, and let him, and let an adversary stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him go forth and them, and let him, and let his prayer be turned into sin. Let his days be few, let, let another take his charge, let his children be fatherless, and his wife be a widow. Let his children be vagabond and beg, and let them seek their bread out of their own desolate places. Let the predator restrain all that he has, and let the stranger make spoil of his labor. Let there be none to extend kindness unto him, neither let there be any to be gracious unto his father's children. Let his parsley be cut off in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his father be brought into remembrance unto the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before you who will continue, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Because that he remember not to do kindness, but persecuted the poor and needy man, and the broken and hard, he was ready to slay. Yes, he loved cursing, and it came unto him, and he delighted not in blessing, and it is far from him. He clothed himself also with cursing, as with his raiment, and, and it is come into his inward parts, like water, and like oil into the, his bones. Let it be unto him as the garment which he puts on, and for the girdle with which he is girded continually. This would my adversary effect from Yahuwah, and they that speak evil against my soul. But you, O Yahuwah, Adonai, deal with me for your name's sake, because your mercy is good. Mm. Deliver you me, for I am poor in me, and my heart is wounded within me. I am gone like the shadow when it is blinking. I am shaken off as the locust. My knees parted through fasting, and my flesh is lean, and has no fatness. I am become also a tongue unto them. When they see me, they shake their head. Help me, O Yahuwah, my Elohim. O save me according to your mercy, that they may know that this is your hand that you, Yahuwah, have done. Let them curse, but bless you. When they arise, they shall be put in shame, put to shame. But your servant shall rejoice. My adversary shall be called with confusion, and shall put on their own shame as a robe. I will give great thanks unto Yahuwah with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude, because he stands at the right hand of the needy to save him from them that judge his soul. Sing it to 
to God all the earth. Sing unto God, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great, and he great to be praised. He is to be feared above all the gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are performed, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto Yah, O the kings of the people. Give unto Yah glory and strength. Give unto Yah the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his court. O worship Yah the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the nations that Yah reigneth. The Lord also shall be established that it should not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad. Let the sea fall and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the forest rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with this truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
This Sidra or Parasha is called Meketz. It means at the end. You know, a lot of us talk about the end of time. Well, this, this is the Meketz means the end. Not the end of time, but the end of a time. We also happen to be at the end of the season of Kanuka, uh, Hanukkah. The feast of the dedication we came in last week, and we're at the tail end of it this week. For those who uh, may not be familiar with that, um, that is the time that we celebrate the feast of the dedication because it was in the time of the Greeks conquering the world that we end up seeing that. Jerusalem and the Holy Land was one of the last places that they made their onslaught on. And they destroyed the temple. And they destroyed and knocked down the holy place. And they polluted all the holy things. And it was in this season that Judah Maccabee and the Maccabee brothers had actually retook the strongholds of the Holy Land and Israel to reestablish the worship, proper worship of the Most High in the Holy Land. And so that's why we call it the Feast of the Rededication of the Temple. That's what the Panuka means. You don't find it in Torah. You have to go to the Book of the Maccabees in order to read about the season. That's why you don't see it as popular as some of the other seasons that we observe. But it nonetheless is a season of observance. And we usually do it by celebrating the festival of lights. You know, um, when uh, in the 1960s, when we were waking up to our uh, black consciousness, trying to celebrate ourselves again as a people, as many of our brothers and sisters were doing a lot of research. So you had Ron Karenga, who did research on African festivals. And because we seem to be inundated, festivals during this season of Christmas and New Year's, he wanted to capture our mind, you know, by bringing us back into a period of our African-centered self. So he decided to come up with what they, we call today Kwanzaa. It is no such thing as an African festival called Kwanzaa on the African continent, but he wanted to borrow from some of the principles of African cultures and put together a festival that was applicable 
to the African American experience. And because at that time, as many of you may remember, a lot of the Pan-African movements, they were leaning towards studying the language of Swahili, thinking that would be the Pan-African or the Africanist language that we would be studying in. So we came up with seven principles that we thought, that he thought, would be advantageous to the rebuilding of the African family and the African mindset. And out of that, he had certain things that were essential to the Kwanzaa table. One of them was actually the menorah. And you know the Swahili and the Hebrew are very close because Swahili is an East African language. And uh, as an East African language, it is partially Semitic and pro 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 partially Kemetic. So certain words within it are very, very similar in its pronunciation. But the menorah was used, but he used the seven because seven is a sacred number. And ordinarily, we use the seven handle or seven prong menorah in our regular temple. We have the seven lights. But during this season, the uh, elders had established an eight-stick candle holder that represented the eight days of the what they deemed as a miracle during this season. When they were restoring the temple and the priests were asked to find oil that was left over in the temple uh, that they can light the candle for the rededication, all they can find in the temple was a flask that was broken. And in that flask that was broken, it only supposedly had enough oil for one night. And as they said to Brother Love, we didn't just use any oil to light our candles. The oil had to be specially compressed from the olive by brothers and the Levites and the priests who knew how to compress the olive to get the oil out of it to light the, lamp, the, um, the lights in the temple. So while they sent brothers to um, seek out those who knew how to construct it and get more oil, the oil they had that lasted ordinarily for one day lasted eight days until they were able to get new oil uh, constructed the way that it's supposed to be according to the fashion that we constructed the oil for the candles in the Holy Temple. So it's based upon that they deemed that a miracle, that the eternal light never went out because we kept an eternal light in the sanctuary at all times, symbolic. And it was the job of the priest to make a sacrifice every sunrise and every sunset. At the rising of the sun, and the setting of the sun that would keep the whole house of Israel blessed. So when they lit that light, they feared that if they lit the light and the light went out, it would be a bad omen. But the light stayed lit for eight days. And because of that, eight days of light out of one day light supply, they said it was a, a miracle. And that's why they call, some people call this the festival of light. We don't call it the festival of light. It's a festival of the rededication. One of the reasons we don't call it the festival of light because words are tricky. Because we also said that Lucifer was the prince of light, you know, the bright morning star. Mm -hmm. So there are those who celebrate that light as the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. That's where they get their name from, Illuminati means illumination. And that also light, you see, for the adversary, you only have to turn good around a little bit to make it bad. But the same thing that you intend for good can be made bad with just a little bit of a twist. And so we're always careful with that. So it's the feast of the dedication but we rededicate the temple of Panuco. And um, it's very important because you get to understand that what happened in the course of history that changed us even unto this day. Although we cry about America, and about London, and about Paris, and France, and about you know Russia, and the Soviet Union, none of them have had the impact that the Greeks had on our culture, which is the culture they feed upon which still impacts us today. So even when you have the Romans, they only inherited Greek culture. So each one of our brothers and sisters that go to institutions of higher learning, most of them have been enticed into joining the sacred brotherhood and sisterhood, fraternity and sorority of the Greeks. And if they knew really what Hanukkah stood for, they would reject that outright because Hanukkah stands for commemorating the resistance against Greek culture and Greek domination and how the Greeks were most responsible for destroying the ancient Semitic Kemetic culture way before the white man with Christianity came out of Europe. The Greeks had already cracked those foundations and messed us up and even chased us down south here. That's how we got to be in the south of the Sahara. We used to rule 
and Iran and Iraq and Egypt and Morocco, all those places. That was ours. It wasn't the white man. It wasn't the Arab. The Arab is only there as a result of being the children of the Greeks and the Romans who mingled with some of our people. That's their pedigree. They are Greeks and Romans. That's where their light skin comes from. That's where their thin hair comes from. And so because they mingle with us on our land is why they have some melanin in them. But they are the children of the Greeks and the Romans. And that history is told in the Apocrypha, and that's why they've taken the Apocrypha out of our normal King James Bible. And those books are not in there. Because with those books being in there, it makes your mind tuned into making the link between contemporary history and the mess that we're in today and ancient history. The way they make the Bible now, they make them in the Bibles in a far away fairy tale land, even in the heavens and the clouds. Not that it's really on the ground. But when you start talking about Alexander the Great and, and, and how he split up his kingdom between his four generals at the time of his death, how those generals cut up the world way before the Berlin Conference, the generals of Alexander the Great divided the world up into four pieces. And they began to rule the world through those four divisional regions way before, like I said, the Berlin Conference carved up Africa. Mm -hmm. It's in that history that you understand how African history was tampered with, how Egyptian history was tampered with, how Asian history was tampered with, how the known history of the world was reconstructed. And they came up with the term, a new epistemology, a new structure of knowledge, a new structure of the word, a new exology, meaning the new definition of the human beings that rule the world. All this is out of the Greek custom, although they trained in Kemet. They trained in Egypt. They trained in, in Ethiopia. They changed the name to Egypt. The very word Egypt is, is Greek. The very word Ethiopia is Greek. The very word Bible is Greek. The very word Genesis is Greek. Deuteronomy is Greek. Exodus is Greek. It showed you how much the Greek language, the Greek mentality, the Greek mind is still influential on us and it's all studied during this period of Kanuka. So, we used to, in the U.S., we wouldn't celebrate Kwanzaa without talking about Kanuka. So we came up with our own term, Kanu Kwanzaa, because we knew it was our brothers and sisters who were lost and didn't know themselves that needed to make up a festival, where we who had found ourselves already had our festivals. So we didn't have to make believe. But in courtesy of us also growing, and in courtesy of us also coming out of the dynamics of that experience in the West, we gave deference to the effort to come back into lightness, so we also gave some credit to that. So that's how we end up um, speaking about the Kwanzaa, but bringing it back to the history of Hanukkah to say that we're not a lost people. We're people that have a culture, and we want to stray from our culture. So we don't have to come up with no make-believe stuff. We can come up with the truth. So I have to state that before going into the lesson this week, since we're closing out. So in that respect, um, we thank the Most High for blessing us coming into the season, for blessing us to come into a knowledge of ourselves, and we have another rich lesson, as I said, at the end. Last week's lesson, I believe, um, covered Yosef going into prison, captivity. Captivity and having been traded because of the confusion of his brethren and the jealousy of his brethren, because of the favor that the father showed him as a younger brother, not the youngest, but near youngest, a younger brother, um, the son of Rachel, a more favored and beloved wife, the jealousy of the children overcame themselves. And so in the squabbling and the arguing of the brothers amongst themselves, they had other I can't say strangers, because they were also cousins. You have Midianites and Ishmaelites mm -hmm. that came along and took advantage of the squabbling of these brothers and purchased Joseph and brought him down into Egypt. But you see, God does everything for a reason. Mm -hmm. Just like, no matter how horrible the story was, no matter how detailed and ugly the narrative is, mm -hmm. millions of us were gathered up here in this land and taken across those waters under the most horrendous circumstances. But when you see what God had planned in terms of making a new world, in terms of bringing a whole new world into existence, the two continents, the world had totally forgotten about, 
I can't say the world didn't know because it was it was well accomplished. You got pyramids in the Americas, like you got pyramids in Egypt. You got the signs of ancient civilizations in the Americas, like you have them in Africa. You got our images there as people of color in the Americas, as you find us in Africa. But the world had forgotten about that. But God was about to do something different with that. And God was not going to do something different with that without us being in the mix, without us being the cornerstone, without us being in the foundation. So something had to be stirred up. And what was stirred up was the North Atlantic slave trade. And millions of us found ourselves on the other side. But God was doing something, just like he stirred up the conflict with these brothers amongst themselves. He stirred up a conflict of envy, a conflict of jealousy, a conflict of influence that ultimately ended up getting one of their brothers taken into captivity and ended up being raised among strangers. But God had another plan to raise him up even in another land to make him a champion, to make him a leader, to make him a savior of the whole world under those circumstances. So it is in that light that we do have uh, a similar parallel story like Joseph. You know, those of our people who are uh, in the diaspora. And so that is what we say that while Joseph was hoping that these two servants that he had helped while he was in prison would give a testimony of his innocence and a testimony of his good character to Pharaoh when they were released, or at least when one was released, but one wasn't really one was released to face his death. And one was released to stay, to find his part. And Joseph was hopeful that the one who found his part would be able to speak about his character to Pharaoh that would ultimately bring about his release. But it shows you that man's time is not God's time. That what we think is time is different from God's time. It's like we say we look at our watch, and our watch says something on it. But is that really what time it is of the day? We look at our calendar. And our calendar says something on it. But that is really the time of the month. Is that really the year? Is that really where we're at? So man has a time, and God has a time. And that's why um, this lesson is called, and at the end. This one is at the end of two years. Meaning two years after Joseph had expected that this comrade in prison would have given a testimony and even got released it wasn't God's time. God had not finished setting up the stage. You know, you learn that when there's a star performer coming to town and he's booked and everybody buys tickets to see that star performer, usually the producers, they also book other acts. And those other acts actually are made to warm up for the star show. And they keep on the stage, but the people came to see somebody. And they keep saying, well, when are they coming on? Who are these people? When are they going to end? When are they going to get off the stage? It's not what I paid for. And they keep on waiting until the build-up comes, the build-up comes, and then the star performers come on, and then you forget all about those amateurs that was on the stage before. Even if they were stars and not amateurs, you know, that's not who you came to see. So you see that some other things had to happen for God to set the stage. It took Pharaoh himself to have a dream. And it took Pharaoh himself to summon all of the magicians, all of the seers, all of the soothsayers, all of them together to say, who can interpret this dream? That's a better stage being set than a whisper from the cupbearer of Pharaoh saying, can I have a word with you, your majesty? Can I have a word with you, my lord? Um, there's somebody in prison that I want to tell you about. Can you imagine that being the stage that Joseph is being released on? Versus the Pharaoh having a dream that troubled his heart and none of the wise men in the land can answer this. And then it comes to the attention of this butler. Wait a minute, I know a man. When I was in prison, I met a man. And that man told me my fate. Not only did he tell me my fate, he wasn't a soothsayer. He was a seer and an interpreter of dreams because he told me I would live and be restored to my position. But he also told my comrade, you're going to die. That ain't no easy thing to say. 
You know how many times many of us get a message to tell our friend and tell our brother and we ain't got the heart to say it? Mm. You say, how am I going to tell him? <laughs> and you yourself code it up. You got the message. You know what you're supposed to tell them. But it's like, I don't know how they're going to take it. And Joseph had to say, you know, after he told the woman, you're going to be released, you're going to be restored to Pharaoh, you're going to be back in his court serving him with wine again. And your days, he said, hey, I had a dream too, tell me my thing. He said, well, you're going to die. <laughs> that wasn't easy to say. <laughs> that wasn't easy to do. Joseph was a man of compassion. He was a man of heart. So naturally, it wasn't a good thing for him to have to deliver that message. But he had to interpret the dream correctly. And that's what made him stand out. And now God is setting the stage. And setting that stage, now the world will be able to see the entrance of one of the most brilliant, gifted, blessed, and anointed saviors of that time. And so, the Bible doesn't lie about Egypt. A lot of people get jealous with the Hebrews about Egypt. Oh, the Hebrews came late, the Hebrews stole this. Oh, it was about Egypt, oh, it was about Kemet, oh, you people were nothing. We see who Egypt was, Egypt was great. Ain't no lie about who Egypt was. Pharaoh was great. It was a magnificent place. But her end was coming. Is this Egypt around today? It's been gone for a while. All the names and the gods and everything we knew, it by and gone. And this is not contradicting Egypt's greatness. It's talking about the God of the universe who causes nations to rise up and nations to come down at his will and at his word. That's the testimony. This is not to disgrace Egypt. Israel was in here. Israel came down. This is about the word of God and that only God is eternal. And then when you stick with God, you are eternal. And you cross God, God will bring you down. That's what this is about. So we shouldn't get it twisted nor confused. This is about the great God of the universe, the one who made the heavens and the earth. Mm. The one who causes whomever he wants to rise up mm. and causes whomever he wants to come back down. Mm. No matter who you are, when we are all living in the system of the beast, mm. we've been living in the system of the beast for 2,500 years. That is the time that we've had from Babylon to now. Mm. 2,500 years ago, mm. Babylon came into prominence in 500 B.C. We're in 2000. That was supposed to be the head of gold. And when God brought down the king of Babylon, he said he turned him into a beast for seven years. Turned the king of Babylon into a beast. Made him lose his mind. He ended up eating grass like a beast from the ground. Not because some pastors said eat it. But for his own nature. His nails grew, he wouldn't cut them. Hair grew out of his body. He hunched over on all fours and was eating grass like a beast. His ministers didn't know what was going on. They were wise enough to hide him from the people. They come and say, can I speak to my Lord? He said, he's busy today. When are we gonna see our king? He's tied up. Why we can't see him? Because he's too busy. They wouldn't tell you he turned into a beast. It all happened that seven straight years he was like that. The most powerful man in the world. He ruled the world at that time. Nobody gave a feast like him. He gave a feast. In those days, they gave one of us, the great king, gave a feast for 180 days. Can you imagine that? You're going to feast for half a year? That's, that's something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's all in that area. From that kingdom, they have one of the seven great wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. They said the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, when we used to travel to um, Jerusalem, it was set on Mount Moriah. And the temple was of such, the kind of granite stone, it was like white, and with the gold in there, it was like you could see the sun. So when you were traveling from Jerusalem on foot, and you got close, you wasn't there. When you looked up on Mount Moriah, you saw the temple that gave you new heart, new spirit, and I'm almost there. I can see the temple far off. It was a great wonder. When you used to come to the great pyramids in Egypt, they weren't looking like sandstone. They were like pure white granite. When you saw them, they like blazed in the sun. But in Babylon, the way they had constructed their city, 
They constructed their city in a way from a distance. When you saw it, it's like the buildings they had, it looked like they touched the heavens, and it was like a hanging, not a hanging plant, but a hanging city. They called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It looked like it wasn't growing up from the ground, but like there was a garden that came from the heavens. That was the magnificence of their architects and their builders. They designed a city that looked like it was suspended from heaven. That's what they call the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. That's one of the seven wonders of the world. I'm saying that to say whom God desires to bring down, he can bring you down. And that's where Babylon was brought down from. So all these kingdoms we see that existed is because of God that they went up high. And when Nebuchadnezzar came out of that spell, he said, the testimony I want to make is that God is not just the God of the heavens, he's the God of the earth. He's the God of everything. Whatever goes on around here, God is in charge of it. God brought him back to his right mind of manhood and intelligence and in clarity. His first word was, God is God. Because you know what struck him down? He went on his porch one day, and he looked out on all of his kingdom. And he said, look what I've got. I'm great now. I'm great. Look what I have done. I'm great. And the Most High God smote him down to show him where that greatness came from. You ain't nothing but a beast until I decide to bestow my honor upon you and place you where I want you to be. And he came out, he got the message. Even as a beast, he must have got that message. <laughs> but he came out and he said, God is God. <laughs> you know, in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. Whatever's happening, whatever's going on, is because God did it. And because God is doing it. Or God will do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm going to read the first three verses in Hebrew. And then... I'm going to make use of Malachi. You're going to read the English portion today. So, it goes like this. Let us say the blessing of the Torah. First, God done. Marku et Yehoah Hamavada Baru, Baru, Yehoa, Hamavara, Hamavara, Yelomwa, eh, Baru, Kata, Yehoa, Lehinomalaka, Olam, Asheva, Kaba, Numi, Koa, Mimi, Matana, Numi, Ekfara, Do, Baru, Baru, Ata, Ata, Yehoa, Yehoa, No Tain, No Tain, Atura, Atura, Bless you, Yehoa, who is to be blessed, Blessed be Yehoa, Blessed be Yehoa, who is blessed, who is blessed, ever and evermore. Blessed thou, thou, Yahuwah, our God, King of the universe, who has selected us from all people and has given us thy law. Blessed thou, thou, Yahuwah, giver of law. Hallelujah. Shame, may be seated. It says, Wayehi mi kets, Shanai, 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 Yami, Upar al Alen, Wahine Emed Al Ayah, Wahine Min Ha Yah, Alet, Sheva, Sheva, Paro, Paro, Yekot, Maet, Who Beri, Beri out, Besha, Watir, and now the Aku, Wahine Sheva, Paro, Akaro, Alo, Aka, Rehem, Min Haya, Raot, Mar Air, the Gako, Basa, the Ah, Mona, Ezel, Aparot, Al, Shabbat, Ah, Al. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, and it happened at the end of two years to the day, meaning on the exact day two years ago, to the act, to the exact day two years ago, Pharaoh was dreaming that behold, he was standing over the river, when behold, out of the river, there emerged seven cows of beautiful appearance and robust flesh, and they were grazing in the marshland. Now, what is important 
then you say at the river. But it's the Nile River. And every year they would perform rituals at the Nile River. And the rituals that they would perform at the Nile River would tell them what the blessing or the curse of the coming year would be. You know, in most of our places, you have sacred areas in every land. Here at Cape Coast, they go to the Fosu Lagoon. And every year before Fetu Afashe, the priests will come out there and they will cast their nets. And according to the catch, they will, they will prophesy what the year will bring. For the plenty, or famine, or sickness, or scarcity. They cast it three times. Sometimes they get worried, but they don't catch nothing. And they say, cast it again. The way they're supposed to cast it all the time, you're only supposed to get about three chances. At the most seven. Your brother comes up scarce. They be, they be wishing, please give me a fish, Lord, show us something. Mm. Now they, they're getting plastic and everything. Show you the sign of the time. Mm. Elmina, the Mbaka Judy have to go to the Benya. They have to go to the lagoon over there. Everybody go over there. They have to pass it. The Nana has to come there. Nana has to witness it. See what's going on. Cape goes, Nana don't go. He sends the priest and the bishop. They have to bring the word back to Nana. The Nana is sitting there waiting for the word. What did you see? So in ancient Egypt, they would do the same thing with the Nile. But the Nile was their source of life. So you can imagine with Pharaoh being, look, seeing himself at the Nile River. And you see these cows coming out. First ones look good. The second one don't look good. But my point is the river. Water is like a voice. Water is a source of life. Water is always sacred. That's why we'll be crying in conditions of our rivers in Ghana. Ghana is a blessed land with beautiful rivers. And all the rivers in Ghana are sacred. But now they're all polluted with galaxy. So you can imagine what that brings as a sign and symbol on the land. But now we've gotten so far in Western culture, they won't allow for the, the local spiritualists to tell you the omen that's with what's happening with the river. Even when the COVID first came in the land, the local priests wanted to go out to pour libations and pray, but the police wouldn't let them gather because they said they had to practice social distancing. Look at the madness. Meanwhile, we've been blessed above other nations. That God has spared us in Ghana and in most of Africa. But how long will God tolerate our ignorance and our stubbornness and our refusing to recognize that we cannot follow these people who have brought their God to us and seek to prosper. Mm. So in that respect, we can't rely on God's mercy when we refuse to abandon our ignorance and our stiff nakedness and our hard heartedness. That mercy is extended for us when we're innocent and when we repent properly if we're guilty, but not when we brazenly continue to ignore the message of God that he puts in front of our face. And it says, and they emerged seven cows of beautiful appearance and robust flesh, and they were gazing in the marshland. Then behold, seven other cows emerged after them out of the river, of ugly appearance, in one flesh, and they stood next to the cows on the bank of the river. How do we are? And the ill favored and lean flesh cow did eat up the second well favored and fat cow. Because of the fan, they may not hear you. So you might have to stand up and we just take a hit. And the ill favored and lean flesh cow did eat up the seven well favored and fat cow. So Pharaoh awoke. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up upon one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven thin ears and glided with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven fat and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. 
And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was none that could interpret them into Pharaoh. And then spoke the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in prison, and the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night. I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man in Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dream. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he saved himself, and changed his raiment, and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have a dream, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee, that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph in my dream, Behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And behold, and behold, there came out of the river seven cows, fat flesh and well favored, and they fed in a metal, needle. And behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ill favored and lean flesh, such as I never saw in the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and ill favored cows did eat the first seven fat cows. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill favored at, at the beginning. So I awoke. And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears withered then and blighted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the thin ears devoured and seven good ears. And I was told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare to me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. Seven, the seven good cows are seven years. And the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill favored cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears and the seven empty ears blighted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he show up unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known unto the land by reason of that famine following. For it shall be very grievous. And for that, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore, let Pharaoh seek out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt, and the seven princes, princes years. And let them gather all food of, of the good years that come, and lay up grain under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities, and that food shall be for storage, and the land against seven years of famine, 
which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. So you see, this is a genius stroke. First of all, when Pharaoh called Joseph, Joseph answered perfectly to be able to give the glory to God. Mm -hmm. He said, the answer is not in me, but rather with God. And so therefore, let's ask God to reveal that which he has shown unto Pharaoh. So he immediately takes the weight off himself and he gives the credit to the Most High. Then he proceeds to interpret the dream. Now to all of us, truthfully speaking, for those of us who read this multiple times, I'm sure one time or another, you had to say, well, that seemed to be a pretty simple dream. <laughs> seemed to be like, maybe I could have did that. But you have to remember, when God is setting something up, look at the time we're living in now. How many times you look at the news and look at these politicians arguing and look at them babbling? And look at them talking all kind of nonsense. And you're sitting in your, in your house saying, but the answer is simple. Why can't they see? When God decides to scramble the wisdom of the wise men and to blind their eyes, even the simplest thing is complicated. It wasn't that they weren't wise men. It wasn't that the dream was complicated. But God had called their time. Their time was up. God was doing something. So the Most High God wanted to shine a light on his servant, Joseph. In order to do that, he put the rest of them in darkness, put the rest of them in ignorance, put the rest of them in folly. They couldn't see themselves in darkness. Now Joseph is saying, after doing all that interpretation, Pharaoh began to say, well, that sounds right. Now, it's not that these men were quiet. They said stuff to please Pharaoh. When you read in the book of Jasper and all of that, they had time to spell it out. They said all kind of nonsense to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, that day, you lying. That don't sound right. <laughs> He gave them. So you're going to kill all of them. That is not said here. Sometimes they said, Pharaoh said, kill all these liars. They've been lying to me all the time. They can't interpret this simple thing. My heart don't feel like they're telling me the truth. So they actually had to beg. They went to search the land before the butler said and remembered Joseph that there was a man that I met in prison. The lot is not set in between the lines. But every wise man was threatened. He coming off the Pharaoh's payroll. You ain't getting paid no more. And half of you, I'm killing you. But you've been lying to me all along. Making up stuff. But Joseph said something that had some substance to it. The substance was made there because God made the heart of Pharaoh connect with the words of Joseph. Because God put the words in Joseph's mouth that made Pharaoh feel, this man sound like he's telling the truth. He made his countenance brighten up because they had to shave Joseph down took all his hair off like an Egyptian, put him up in a robe, put a gold chain around his neck. They had to make him presentable, and Pharaoh's caught. And then it was the Spirit of God that came on Joseph that Pharaoh saw something in him. He said, wait a minute, this man looks different. This man sounds different. This man's got an aura on him. And the man's words are soothing my heart. And you know, Joseph knew he was getting it. That's why Joseph said, and now what you need my Lord, is to find somebody with understanding. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, all the wise men there had no understanding. And let him be put over charge of what you need to do. Now what you really need to do is to make sure somebody puts up a storehouse and you take 20% of everything that is happening for seven years and put that down in the storage. So that 20% for seven years it's going to be almost 140% that you're going to need to carry you through another seven years. That should be more than enough to get you. But he gave Pharaoh the plan already. So Pharaoh ain't got to look nowhere. So, well, the man you talk about was in front of me. How did you take this job on? Joseph was like, that's my party. <laughs> but you see the wisdom in all of that. The thing comes out beautifully when you put God before you. Most High ain't gonna let you down. And Joseph put the Most High in front of him, laid everything out, and everything fell right into place. Come to you. Yeah. Amen. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of all his servants. And the Pharaoh said unto his servant, Can we find such? Can we find such an one as this? 
as this is. You see, now the servants, now they're all on trial because Pharaoh said, you're going to find somebody to interpret his dream, all y'all going to die. Now once Pharaoh starts saying, you know, that sounds right. They say, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Because <laughs> so they're thinking that we need somebody to save our lives. <laughs> so it wasn't just that they loved Joseph. And they were, they were like, thank God, we got some time to breathe. So now they're going to support. I think he's the one who should do it. But me, they all got they all got a little reprieve to get their lives saved. That's where all that support was coming from. Yeah. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such as one as this is, a man at whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Go as, as much as God hath shown thee all this. There is none so discreet and wise out there uh, and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the only in the throne will I be greater than that. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, well, This is what they call, literally this is what you call a regent. The interpretation, he was like a viceroy. Another interpretation for a viceroy is a regent. Meaning that you're in charge. Only thing you are not is on the throne. It's just like the throne is not for you. And the throne, I'm more powerful than you. But in everything else, it's on your word that everybody else moves. This was the this was the first title that His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie had. Before he became Emperor of Ethiopia, he was the regent. His wife was the ruler. So the ruler of Ethiopia was his wife, Queen Menin. So she was the daughter of Menelik II. So she was the rightful inheritor to the throne. So he became the regent. And he ruled for a while as a regent until she died. When she died is when he came and took the actual throne and became the Emperor of Ethiopia. So that has eclipsed the fact that his wife ruled and the wife was a direct line. He was a cousin. He was a nephew. But his wife was in the direct line. So in that respect, what you have here is Joseph is the viceroy or the regent. He, his word rules, but he's not the one on the throne by bloodline. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried of before him, bowed a knee, and he made him ruler over the land of Egypt. So you see that pride, one, that's in our culture. You have people who go before the king. You know, like, bow down, here comes Joseph, the ruler of the land, the viceroy. He rides the second behind Pharaoh. No man is greater in Egypt than him but Pharaoh and sits on the throne. They have pride to go before him to sing his praise and to sing his accolades. That's what they do in the culture here. I saw that in Senegal. They come in, in Ghana. But in Senegal, when you have any ruler come out, you come, even when you come to a party. I went to a wedding one time, and it was like the, the groom wasn't there, only the bride. About 500 women, about 25 men. So I said, where's the, bride, the groom at? They said he's in London. He'll be, in, he'll be here for Christmas. That's said, how did he get married? I said, we don't need him. The families are getting married. So, so I said, wow, this is serious here. So anyway, you know, there was the people pulling up in their cars, and they got out their cars. You know, someone brought gifts and everything. There was one woman in there. She run over to him and said, I said, well, why is this woman arguing with everybody coming? She don't like nobody. They said, no, she's not arguing with everybody. She's singing their praises. Everybody that comes, she has to sing their praises. Mm -hmm. She has to sing. Kwame has come. He's left his home. He left his family. He's come to this great day to adorn this wedding. Look at the gifts that he has brought. This is a great man. Sing his praises. And he said, Ajo has come. She's left from her grave. She's traveled a great distance. She's brought gifts. Look how she is arrayed. She's arrayed here in all these beautiful garments. She's come here to bring her presents to this wedding today. I said, wow, man, they know how to treat an ego, boy. They really need you to make them feel good here. They're standing there like this. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I mean, I've arrived. They got there. They're standing there bashing in all of this. 
And they walk up there, and she's still crying and telling the person, I said, wow, this is serious. You know, this is, this is a nice culture here. Bring your brother in the hood hear about this. <laughs> so they said, they had criers to go before him. You know, they would sing his praise, his accolades, and all that he's done. And they would sing that, and everywhere he'd go, they opened up the way before him. Then they just grabbed the limousines. You know, <laughs> 40 car motorcade, ain't nobody saying nothing. <laughs> look, 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 look at the petrol they wasted. <laughs> and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, bowed a knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Yosef, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Yeah. And Pharaoh called Yosef's name Zaphnatha. Where are you at? Um, 45, 45. Is there, yeah. Zaphnat Pania. And he gave him as his wife. As it says as the, the the one, the one to whom secrets are revealed. The one whom the gods favor. Well, that's what it means. The one that was like it, 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 it's, a, it's an honorable, you know, you go to land, you get a stool name. So now he has to have a stool name, a throne name, that, that, that speaks to whom he is and his greatness. And now he's going to be given a stool wife. He's going to be given a, a woman. Now this is the beginning of the Egyptian Hebrew, the Hebrew Egyptian. You know, not necessarily like that because um, Abraham's seed, Ishmael, was a Hebrew Egyptian. Now you see, that's why I say the mixture up of Kim and Shem is from the very foundation, not like later on. From the very foundation of building the houses, you see the mixture. The Japheth was the father of the Gentiles, but you don't see Kem or Shem called Gentiles. It's only Canaan that was for, forbidden for us to mingle with. But the other seeds of Kem, meaning Cush and Mizraim, and put a little curse on them was Canaan. So you see Manasseh and Ephraim are Hebrew Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Because this is a, a priest's daughter. And because of Joseph's station, he has to be able to satisfy the rituals of the land taken the Egyptian wife. So his name is he whom secrets are revealed and the hidden things are shown that nothing is hidden from him. Priest of Moon and Joseph went out over the own own is not up north. Own is not Cairo. Own is down south. Own is in the city like um, they call, later called, the Greeks called Heliopolis. But On is where the most sacred temples of Egypt were. That's down there in Thebes. On is down south where they kept, when the Greeks came in, they built their own cities down there to cover up what the ancient Egyptians had done. The whole city was considered a holy city. And the most sacred oracles and sacred temples was in Om. To us, it's like the city of light. But that was, her father was from one of the most sacred uh, temples in Egypt, in southern Egypt. And because of the racism of the Arabs, they don't tell us that the most sacred pyramids are in Sudan. They're not in up, uh, Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt is north, and Upper Egypt is south, because the Nile flows from south to north. So because the culture comes from the south, Ethiopia, it came up north, the most sacred shrines and temples are down south. Because they don't want to give no credit, because all the melanated people are down south, and the Arabs are taking the north. And because of the tourism and the money, they want everybody to go to the sacred pyramids up north. And then it is true that the Cheops is there, which they call Cheops, but it's really Khufu. The Great Pyramid of Cheops is the, is the one that Khufu built. 
that was the Pharaoh or the ruler of Khufu. He built that. So the attention is there. But all the sacred ones are down south. And that's where uh, Asenat's father was from at the priest the temple he was initiated. Yeah. Those was, are important points because they just go through it fast. Mm -hmm. Even I went through it fast. But those are very important landmarks and points for later discussion. Priest of home. And Yosef went out over all the land of Egypt. And Yosef was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Yosef went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven and in the seven plenteous years the earth brought forth by handful. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and and laid up the food in the city. Uh, Sweetheart, uh, again, I want to make the point because you recognize that this is another one of the time the term Kohen comes up for Aharon. I say it because it's important that we know the better. Group. First time you hear the term Kohen comes up with Melchizedek. And then you hear it come up here with Asenat's father, with Kohen. Um, that own, uh, priest of own. Then you hear come up with Moses' father-in-law, Yitro, Kohen of Midian. So the order that we always say come up, we came up and the best of Ethiopia and Egypt, along with the revelation of Moses, how he set up the priesthood of Israel. So then it was with Aharon was made a Kohen and then all his sons after that. That Kohen means priest or chief, but a custodian of the culture. It mainly meant the custodian of the culture, the sacred things and the history. So you see that term, that's why I wanted to point that out. So when you see that term priest, in the Hebrew when you read it, it says Kohen. And it's giving you an introduction of the line that comes up out of that. And so as another note that we need to take note of, but we're reading in the Hebrew. You see, there's only a few places that it appeared before the sons of Aaron were initiated into the priesthood. That's one of the reasons why when we talk here, we say not only the priest of Aharon, but we start off with the priest of Melchizedek, because we know the foundation is the priesthood of Melchizedek, who blessed Abraham and gave Abraham the blessing of the priesthood to his priesthood. That's why he said he was the, he was the king of righteousness and the priest of the Most High, the King of Peace, of Selam, the King of Righteousness, and a priest unto El Elyon, because it says, Kohen la El Elyon, the priest of the Most High. And it's in that priesthood that Abraham paid him tight and got the blessing of the priesthood that would eventually pass down through Ahar, through Levi, and then through Aharon, and then through the sons of Aaron. So there's a, there's a line that it comes through, and that line starts with Melchizedek. Food of the, the food of the field which was round about every city laid he up in the same. And Yosef gathered grain as sand of the sea, very much until he ceased numbering, for it was without number. And until Yosef was born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Azadeth, the daughter of Hoks, the daughter of Ponti Farah. Ponti Farah. Priest of On bore unto him. And Yosef called the name of the first one. And that's why they mention it. See, the Torah is very subtle, yet it's very pronounced. They keep mentioning his station because it's a pedigree. Mm -hmm. And they're mentioning the pedigree of, but that the house of Joseph was built up on. And God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called, hold on, sweet God. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil. Manasseh means forgetting, forgetting. Forget all my toil in all my father's house. And the name of the second called Ephraim, but God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my flesh. So Ephraim means fruitful. 
And seven years of plenteous that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And seven years of famine begin to come according to Yosef has said. And the famine was in all land, but in all the lands of Egypt there were bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Yosef, what he said to you do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Yosef opened all the storehouses and sold them to the, Egypt, the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. And all the countries came into Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was so severe in all lands. Yeah. Now when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said unto his son, Why do they look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Get you down there and buy for us from there, that we may live and not die. And Yosef, ten brethren, went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Benjamin, Yosef's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest perhaps this mischief befall him. And the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those that came for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land. And he, it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to earth, to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them. But he but made himself strange unto them and spoke roughly unto them. And he said unto them, From where come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. See, he set it up, because Joseph knew, being a wise man he was, he even set up the land of merchandising, so that he knew that his family would be flushed out of Canaan, because of the famine. And he knew everybody was coming from all over to buy grain. And he wanted to make it such that when they showed up, they had to see him. And he had to see them. So everywhere he had spies on the gates. And he had people working for him to look out for every stranger that came in the line. So that he already had an eye looking for them. They also knew and had an idea that Brother Joseph was in the line. They had no idea he was on the throne. They thought that he was in the houses of, you know, lordness and all that kind of thing. But in any event, they realized that with that, when they came, when he came in, he came in, they, they came in before him, he knew them right away. First of all, the language. He knew the Hebrew. They didn't necessarily know the Egyptian language. So when they're talking, he had already put the spies on what to look for. So in those days, bowing down to the earth was like a shaking of a hand today. When you came before the third, you were you just bow down before them. Like today, we just go like this, or you just go like that. But note that they did that. So they naturally bowed down. Now he's got them under scrutiny because he's got them where he wants them. Because all the time, he's also thinking, they never looked for me. They never came to look for me. They never came to find out if I'm dead or alive. Nothing happened, no spies, nobody asking in the land. So he had, he's on a mission. And he knew the famine would sort them out. And, and Yosef saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange to them, and spoke roughly unto them. And he said unto them, From where you come in? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Yosef knew his brethren, but they knew not him. And Yosef remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Yea, our spies, to see the nakedness of the land, ye are, ye are come. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food and thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land, we are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren. 
the sons of one man in the land came. And behold, the youngest is this day without father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, That is it that I spoke unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Hereby ye shall be tested by the life of Pharaoh. Ye shall not go forth from here, except your youngest brother come here. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested, whether there is any truth in you or else. By the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. And he put them all together into prison three days. And Joseph said unto them, the third day, the third day, this do and live, for I fear God. And if ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry grain for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother to me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he, he saw us. And we would not hear, therefore, if this distress come upon us. So you see, they knew. <laughs> Joseph didn't say he's Joseph. You don't, they don't know who they're talking to. But yet, when they're thrown in jail, and yet when he says, go back and get your younger brother, and a whole one of you, now they're starting to think amongst themselves and to argue. You see, it because of that thing we did. That thing we did with our brother Joseph, it ain't never been right. And God's been waiting to pay us back. And now that time is here. You know, they argue amongst themselves because they know that this thing is hanging over their head. Not only was it this thing done all these years back, but every day they see their father mourning for a brother and a son that's lost. And they got to lie to him. But Jacob said, are you sure you told me everything you know about your brother Joseph? They said, yes, Dad, we told you everything. Are you sure you told me everything? Yeah, we told you everything. So they got to lie every day. They got to lie every time it comes to their father's mind. They ask them that question over again. They got to lie. The whole that lie still. Now, they're in jail. For what? Come and buy food? They said, no, I'm everybody's buying food every day. People come from all over to buy food. Why have we got to be in jail? It's that thing. It's that thing we did and we didn't do right. And we've been lying every day to our father. We done brought age on our father. You see how you done aged all these years like that? God is getting us back now. And you know, everybody's been in a situation where you done said, this must be for that thing I did. <laughs> so now they're going through this thing. Now they got to go back to their father and ask their father to release their younger brother and that ain't no easy task. And, they, and Reuben answered them, saying, Spoke I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and he will not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them. Right, he did. Joseph is listening to them argue, so they come back to their own town. And they're arguing in Hebrew. They don't know that Joseph is hearing everything that they're saying, but they also know the Hebrew. And now they're blaming each other. Because Reuben is the firstborn, he said, I told you all in the beginning not to mess with him. <laughs> you wouldn't want to listen to me. And I turned my back and then you wouldn't put him in a ditch and all this kind of nonsense and come on all of y'all. So everyone said, well, it wasn't me. I also spoke. Well, I didn't have nothing to do with it. And then Joseph was listening to him. <laughs> Doing all the arguing. He listened to see who's saying what. Joseph knew which ones hated him the most. That's the one he will pick out. Because it was in Simeon, his older brother, hated his guts. It used to be a time Simeon didn't even want to see Joseph come in the room. If he come in the room, Simeon would turn his back. I don't want to see his face. Now he's a spoiled brat. You know, the father gives him everything. We need to teach him a lesson. That was Simeon's thing. And so Joseph was looking at all of them. That's why Joseph will say, let me take Simeon, I'll hold him. But he knew he was the one the most guilty that, that didn't like him the most. And they knew and they knew not that Joseph understood them. But he spoke to them by the interpreter. And he turned himself about by right, a language. A Chiami. Here you know in Ghana, you know, the king is not supposed to talk to you direct. 
but sometimes today, because of modern entity, they break it and they'll talk to you direct. But no king on the throne is supposed to speak to you direct. He's supposed to speak to a Chiami, an interpreter. And he will tell you what the king has said, usually in a more eloquent manner. But he's not to deviate from the principle. I know that there were times I've caught the king correct the Chiami and tell him, tell him directly what I said, but that's not what I said. And he'll break rank and say, that's not what I said. Tell him what I said. But sometimes the Chiami will think that maybe the words are too strong, maybe the words are too heavy, and they'll try to dress it up. And at that time, maybe Nana wanted it to be heavy. They said, tell him what I said. Don't dress it up. So what you have is because Joseph spoke to a Chiami. He spoke to an interpreter. But because of the, the um, English and the European interpretation, they won't say it like from the culture as we know it from a Chiami or from a, a spokesperson. They just say interpreter. But it's a higher station than an interpreter. It's a Chiami, a linguist. And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and spoke with them and took them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. So he said, he said, lock him up and bind him. He said, Simeon. He said, why he pick Simeon? And now the brothers know, Simeon was the one that didn't love him too. <laughs> How did he know that? He picked Simeon, Simeon was the one that hated him. How did he know that? So he said, he bound up Simeon, man. Wow, you see that? So, and then it was the whole thing was, none of the Egyptians, they say, and the legend when you read it, they said none of the Egyptians could bind up Simeon. When they couldn't bind him up, he thought they couldn't hold him. So Joseph actually called out Ephraim and Manasseh, his sons, his young boys, and they bounded him. And their sons of, oh, how did he do that? Because nobody can bind up none of the sons of Abraham unless they know the power of the Most High. Hmm. These two are different. How can these two bind up one of the sons of Abraham and one of the sons of Jacob? They began to think like, no, something else is going on. He picked up Simeon. Simeon ain't no joke, because with Simeon and Levi, that destroyed the whole city. How can these two small boys bind up Simeon? And they also were the power of the God of Abraham. So that's how he binded them. But all these things are part of the signs that were going on. And it's making them all, their mind go crazy inside of them. Then Joseph commanded to fill their stone. And he turned himself about from them and wept. And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and spoke with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with grain and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. And they loaded their asses with grain and departed from there. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass father in the end, he discovered his money for the whole, it was in his sack's mouth. And he said unto his brethren, my money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, what is this that God hath done unto us? <laughs> that God has done unto them. <laughs> And they came unto Yaakov, their father, and unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell unto them, saying, The man who is the lord of the land spoke roughly to us, and took us for spies of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies, we are twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man the Lord of the country said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your household, and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me, then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So will I deliver you from your brethren, and ye shall do business in the land. And it came to pass that they emptied their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And, ja and Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. 
Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and he will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Slay my two sons if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. And we see before him by the way in which he go, then shall you bring down my gray hairs with sorrow. Hallelujah. And the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Yehuda spoke unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, You shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But thou wilt not send him, but if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me, as to tell the man whether he had yet a brother? And they said, The man asked us carefully of our state, and our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? So you see, they had all confused. First, when they were saying that Jacob was saying, you, look, you got me in all this trouble again. You got me missing one son has already been missing for all these years. Now you come back and tell me I got another son locked up in jail, Simeon. And you tell me I got to release the youngest son to go with y'all. There's no way I'm doing that. You, all, you people have brought all this trouble to me. And so they said, forget it. Then they're getting hungry. He said, go back and buy some food. He said, Judah is speaking now. But I told you, we can't go back there unless we bring our youngest brother. We told you that. And he said, well, why do you have to tell them that I had another son anyway? Why do you have to tell them there's another son here? Why do you have to be opening up your mouth and saying all of that? He said, but the man spoke to us direct. He asked us, is our father alive? He asked us, is this all of you here? The man was also asking direct questions. What are we supposed to do? He said, to lie to whatever. You had to tell them I had another son here. You, you bastards and and they got me in all this trouble. And you, now, you, remember you telling me I can kill my two grandsons because they're your sons? Is that going to do anything for me? Because you said kill my two sons if I don't bring another son? It's all my sons. So you can imagine stuff going on in there. What in the world are you, what, you fool stuff? What is this? <laughs> you know, everybody go to Egypt to come back with food. They got their sons. They go to Egypt to come back with food. They got their sons. And you come back here with, with a son missing again. Then somebody locked up, you say, well, he might be dead too. Then you say, trust you with another one? <laughs> There's no way in the world. They got all this confusion going on. So, you see, when the most high would have stirred you up, he said, your time is coming, it's coming. They got to pay. And we told him according to the tenor of these words, could we certainly know that he would say, bring your brother down. And Yehuda said unto Israel, his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little one. I will be surety for him, of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except, for except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. And, the, and their father, Israel, said unto them, if it, were, if it must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruits of the land and your vessels, and carry down the man a present, a little balm, and a little honey spices, and myrrh nuts, and almonds. And take double money in your hand, and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sack, carry it again in your hand. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise. Go again unto the man. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man. So you see, Judah's name means um, let Yah be praised. And Judah's name alone, when he was, um, you know, born is like, you know, praise ye Yah. Mm -hmm. So there was a special angel that went with Judah. That's why he got the blessing. That's why the kings came through there. The father knew this. 
So the words of Judah comforted the heart of the father. He said, okay, we're in this predicament. And if Judah is making that pledge, then I got to trust and let him go with Judah. And Judah put himself in that stead. But it was because of the blessing and the angel that's with Judah that the father's heart. Now the father also went to pray. And it's the spirit that told him to trust him in Judah's hand. And Judah will watch over him. And it's because of that. He didn't just say it. He did pray. And the spirit gave him to let, trust him with Judah. And I'll be with Judah. And Judah will bring him back. And God the Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother. Benjamin, if I, bereave, if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And the men took that present. And they took double money in their hand. And Benjamin and rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with him, he said to the ruler of his house, bring these men home and slaughter an animal and make ready for these men shall die with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph ordered. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said because of the money that was returned in our sack. So see, their mind is going wild again. Joseph was going to pay. Joseph was setting up for a feast to really dine them. But they said, why is he bringing us in the house? Why are we in the market? We, we, are you sure we're going to get out of here? We're going to bring us in the house and kill us. You know, so they don't know what to think of this gesture. It's a gesture of kindness, but they're in total confusion. <laughs> because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time, are we brought in that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for slaves and our asses? And they came there to the steward of Joseph's house, and they spoke with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir. We came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass when we were, when we came to the end, that we opened our sack. And behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack. Our money is in full weight. And we have brought it again in our hands. So you see, it's just like you're in a puzzle with a situation. They all talking to themselves. They can't figure nothing out. And they say to themselves, hey, I'm going to go speak to that guy at the door, man. Let me go speak to him. He says, excuse my brother. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. When we left here the last time, the money was in our bag. You know, we don't know how it got there. So he, and uh, we're innocent, man. You know, so I don't know if that's why we're being brought here or what, but he said, oh, I'm going to go talk to that guy. Man. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to talk to him. I'll talk to him. And they had to roll up on the brother. They had to spill all their beans out. That this, The money got back in our bag. We don't know how the money got in our bag. We didn't mean it. We brought it back, the money is back here, and plus we got money to buy something new, but uh, I don't know if this sound right, but if we get a word into your Lord and let him know that we didn't steal nothing. <laughs> but if you can get a word in for us, and you know, usually that's what you do, you go talk to somebody on the door, you talk to somebody familiar, you get a word in here, so you get your edge going on. So that's all that guilty conscience they got unfolding here. And he said, peace be to you, fear not. The God and the God of your father have given you treasure in your sack. I had your money, and he brought Simeon out unto them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their asses father. And they made ready the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand and into the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom he spoke? Is he yet alive? And they answered, I serve our fathers in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obedience. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother ben Benjamin his mother's son, and said, is this, your, is this your younger brother of whom you've spoken to me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, but his heart yearned over his brother, and he sought where to weep. And he entered his, into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out, and controlled himself, and said, set on bread. And they set on 
for him by himself and for them by themselves and for the Egyptians which who did eat with me by themselves because the Egyptians might eat bread with the Hebrews for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians and they sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth and the men marveled one at another and he took and sent messes unto them from before him but Benjamin messed with sleep but Benjamin messed with five times as much as any of did and they drank and were very merry hallelujah so you see they also the way they set the dining they set the dining up in an order special order Joseph ate by himself the son his 12 sons ate by themselves and the Egyptians ate by themselves in those days, the Egyptians were refined, refined in their urban style and clean cut. And the Hebrews were bearded, their hair, and all of that. So they said they didn't eat together. So you realize that the sons of Israel, he set them up by order of their age. And they thought that was another marvel and wonder how does he know us? How does he know who's the eldest, second born, third born, fourth born, fifth born? All these were marvels that they kept doing. Then how did they give all of the gifts to all the sons were one measure, and the gifts to Benjamin was of another measure, meaning his real son, his real brother by same father, same mother, not real, but same father, same mother. And they were looking at all these signs he's setting before them. And periodically, Joseph could not hold himself together, but the emotions kept overcoming him while he's setting the stage, almost as a give giveaway. Yeah. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sack with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his grain money. And he said, that, and he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. And soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away. They and their asses. And when they were going out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men. And when thou doest overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Hmm. Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth, ye have done evil in so doing? And he overtook them, and he spoke unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore say, my Lord, these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to, do, do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sack's mouth, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of the Lord's house silver or gold? So you see the, um, another method there was, the cup, he said, is the cup that I drink it out of and the cup whereby I do divine. So, you know, in those days they had many of the spiritual sciences whereby they would speak or read. And this was something that before the Torah, uh, Joseph was a master, a master astronomer, astrologer, and read tea leaves. So out of that cup, he said, don't you know I divine out of that cup? I can see. Now, it's not only the cup, like they say, people in East India, they read tea leaves. But in the cup, before mirrors were popular, you could see in water. A mirror is nothing but water and sand. You can see your image in water. And there are certain cantations that they do, you can also see. And like they say crystal balls. But they knew the science. So he was saying, don't you know that cup is the cup that I use to divide and I use for spiritual purposes, and yet that's the cup that you took, even though they didn't take it, you planted it. It's all for a setup to really test their heart and know who it is that they are. But it's spoken of significantly here that he used it in that phrase, not just drinking. And they said unto him, Wherefore say, my Lord, these words, God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks now, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of the Lord's house 
silver or gold. Be with whomever of thy servant it be found. Both let him die. And also, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. And you see this lesson is exactly how Joseph's mother Rachel died. Because they spoke rashly. That's why words, you have to be very careful. When Jacob was leaving his father-in-law Laban, he didn't know that Rachel had stolen her father's gods. And she hid them. She said she stole them because she didn't want her father to consult with them to find out where they were at and where they were at on their journey. Because he could consult those gods and say, where are they at, talk to them, and thus and thus and thus and thus. So she claimed that I didn't steal them to worship them, but I stole them to protect us from my father. But she did not tell Jacob. And by not confiding in her husband, although she meant it for good, it ended up being a curse. Because when the father-in-law came to Jacob and said, you stole my gods, he said, a thief, you're mad that you stole from me all these years. Made me work for you for 20 years. You know, made me pay for every sheep that was lost, every goat that was lost. I stayed out, I took the weight. And you want to come and call me a thief? I ain't no thief. Anybody who has their gods on them, let them die. But he didn't know that his wife had those gods on her. And he spoke those words. So here it is, they're about to speak again and said, we ain't no thieves. Anybody got a couple of you finding one? Let them, let them, you know, take them. Let them die. But he didn't examine to see if the cup was on them. Meanwhile, you know you had the, 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 um, the money was on you. You didn't know how it got there. So you should also think, let me let them search first before you speak so wildly, you know, by heart. That's why you have to always think before you pronounce things strong. We used to have to say, roll your tongue around your mouth seven times before you utter one word. But some of us speak by heart and blow it out there and you wish you could take it back. And you can't take it back. It's out there. So in this instance, it's the same thing. You know, he said, always think before you speak. And um, so is that that speaking by heart or speaking too fast without thinking. And he said, now also let it be according to your word, he with whom it is found shall be my servant, and he shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the elder, and ceased at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Now you can imagine now, <laughs> out of all the sons, it's found in Benjamin's sack. And you can imagine all the, oh my father, what is my father going to say? My father told us this thing right here. No way in the world. Anybody's sack but Benjamin. And then they tore their clothes and loaded every man his ass and returned to the city. And Yehuda and his brethren came to Yosef's house, for he was yet dead, and they fell before him on the ground. And Yosef said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Know ye not that such a man as I can certainly divide? So he's saying again, Don't you know I can look into things and see? You gonna try to steal something from me? You don't think I don't have a way of coming to find out? And Yehuda said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of, our, of thy servant. So you see, he ain't talking about no stolen cup. Judah ain't talking about no stolen cup. He ain't talking about no stolen money. He said, hey, all right, we got to confess. We, God found out we sold our brother. We're all guilty. <laughs> He's, he's ready to tell everything that's on his mind. He said, what shall we do? What shall we say? God has found us. And we're guilty. What are we going to do about it? So he got, he's, he's, he's pouring his heart out. He's about, he's about the only one that can really speak to the moment and to the hour to get things straight. What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of thy servant. Behold, we are my Lord's servant, both we and he, also with whom the cup is found. And he said, 
God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is bound, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, you see, there's no way. Judah said, we all here. We all going to be servants. We all did wrong. Take us all. Joseph said, no, no, no. I ain't going to take you all. I just want the one who the cup was found with. Give me him. Y'all go back to your father. Mm. You know? <laughs> we can't. <laughs> yeah, we can't go back. You don't understand. We got to all hang out here and be your servants. You know, we got to all go. But there's no way we can go back to the old man and say, <laughs> Benjamin ain't here. Mm. So there's just no way. So all but none. You got to take us all. Oh, you got to let us go. But if, if Joseph is testing, is there remorse? Have y'all learned how to stick together? Hmm. Have you learned how to defend one another? Hmm. Have you learned all for one and one for all? Hmm. Have you learned that lesson? Are you sorry for what happened to me all these years ago? And has the brotherhood learned a lesson hmm. to stand up for one another? Hmm. Those are the virtues those are the principles. That is the heart that he's looking for in this whole matter. And he had to stretch them. He wants to see if they say, well, you know, we don't know how it got there, but it ain't us. We gone. Mm. And they know that it had to be with Benjamin because they know it's about the division around these mothers. Because the mothers have planted something in the children. And the mothers have said that the sons of Rachel are always favored by our father. And that's the poison that came into them to do wrong to Joseph. Now Joseph got to know, is the other only son, my brother is out there with the same mother, do those brothers have the same feeling about him? Would they sell him out? Or would they embrace him as a brother? Do they see us as one family now? And the fact that they were able to see them as their brother and one family, and we can't do that no matter what, he's our brother. We're not gonna go back and tell our father we left our brother here. And Joseph had to feel that repentance. He had to feel that that lesson was learned. He had to feel that that love was there before he would exonerate them and let them know who he is and embrace them. And bring them back. But unfortunately, that's for another people. So we end with that suspense with the Torah this week. There's not a suspense, but with that drama for a week. So as we always do, we uh, thank you for that reading. Uh, if any any um, questions, um, in relation to the lesson.